Hi everyone. Hello and welcome. I'm Avni Bansal, pursuing masters from Harvard Law School. We've gathered here today for a discussion on access to justice, India's unique challenges. Law and justice are two terms that each one of us has to engage with at one time or the other, either because one's own personal experiences or because of the seeming frustration with the legal system in India. So as we gather today here, the big question that we are posing is, India is forging on the path to development, but what about the legal reforms that India requires? What about the questions of access to justice? And access to justice not just for you and for me, because in a way even we are victims, but also of the last person on the street. I am very excited because we have put together a wonderful line of speakers for you, bringing in different perspectives. We have perspectives today that we're going to hear from, from the World Bank, from Think Tank based in New Delhi, and from the civil society. Also, we have a wonderful moderator in Nick Robinson. And my job right now as I stand before you is to introduce Nick to you before he launches us in discussions. Now, Nick is a wonderful person to be moderating this panel because, for one, he brings in an objective perspective to this panel, somebody looking at India from outside the India, if you will, but also somebody who has vast experience living in India and dealing with the system and seeing the actors from within. Nick has spent seven years in South Asia, during which time he was clerking for the Chief Justice of the Indian Supreme Court. He was also teaching at several law schools in India, most notably the National Law School of Bangalore. And Nick was also a senior fellow at Center for Policy Research, uh, New Delhi. Currently, uh, Nick is a visiting lecturer in law and a Robina Foundation visiting human rights fellow at the Orwell Shell Center for International Human Rights at Yale Law School. Before that, Nick was a resident at the Center for Legal Profession at Harvard Law School. So his areas of expertise really are quite wide and includes, he has written extensively about the judicial process, the public law, and legal education in India. So I'm sure you want to hear right away from them. So can we please have a huge round of applause and um, launch into discussion straight away? Thank you. Thank you, Avni. Um, and I, I also want to put a special thanks for Avni and for the other students for putting this panel together. It's a, it's a wonderful panel. We have uh, a really illustrious and well-informed uh, group. I've been to uh, this conference now maybe three years, and I'm always three years in a row, and I'm always so impressed um, by who the students are able to bring in. Um, you don't want to hear much from me. You have the bios of everyone, the extended bios. So what I'm going to do is just give a short bio of each speaker. Um, each speaker will have about 10 minutes, and then hopefully we'll have plenty of time uh, for conversation afterwards. Um, so. Beginning today, uh, Professor Mohan Gopal will begin. Uh, he is the director of the Rajiv Gandhi Institute for Com Con Contemporary Studies and the former director of the National Judicial Academy and the National Law School of India uh, University in Bangalore. He's been working on access issues now for three decades or so or, or longer in India, uh, brings an incredible amount of expertise. And since uh, 2011, uh, Professor Gopal has headed uh, the National Court Management Systems Committee of the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, he's also been a former member of a of various panel, uh, of, of various uh, regulatory bodies and committees, um, notably for our purposes today, the Law Commission of India. He also spent uh, a fair amount of time at the World Bank uh, before returning to India. Um, after him will be uh, Mr. Amitabha Mukherjee, who is uh, a lead uh, public sector specialist in the World Bank's public governance global practice, uh, leading and managing public sector modernization projects across countries while specializing in uh, the Europe, while specializing in Europe and Central Asia. Um, Notably, he also manages the World Bank's Justice Peer Assistance Learning, or JustPal, and you can go to www.justpal.org if you want to learn more, um, which he established in 2011. Uh, he also spent time in India before joining the World Bank as an IAS officer um, in Gujarat, I believe, right? And Bengal. Uh, and Bengal, Gujarat and Bengal. Um, and then after him, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Mrs. Chaya uh, Pumala, uh, who is the co-founder and CEO of PAM10 Incorporated, um, which is an IT solutions company uh, with offices both in the US, Canada, and India. Um, she also founded and runs uh, Softkin, which is 
uh, stands for Support Organization for Kids in Need, an organization that creates homes for impoverished, impoverished women and children and focuses on leadership and education. Um, she's also a trustee of the Mahar Ashram, which is a rural development NGO, which has programs for destitute women, children, elderly, and the mentally impaired. Um, in the course of all this work, uh, she has worked with a lot of impoverished communities and come across many kind of access to justice issues firsthand. So as I said, we have a, a really well-informed and incredible panel, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing from all of you. So uh, Professor Mohan Gopal, the floor is yours. Thank you. Am I good? Is this all right? Yeah, okay. No, no. yeah. okay. Thank you, Nick, and it's a, a, a great pleasure to be here. <clears throat> uh, since we have limited time, I'll, I'll uh, get straight to my points. Um, I've been, uh, I, I used to live in the US for many years working uh, at the World Bank. I was also teaching uh, at Georgetown Law School. And I've been back in India now for 12 years. This is the 12th year. And I've worked very, very intensively in these 12 years on the legal and judicial system. I've had the privilege of uh, heading the National Law School, the National Judicial Academy, and uh, also and, and continuing to work uh, at, uh, with uh, the judiciary as the head of the National Court Management Systems Committee now. And I've probably had uh, an opportunity to meet with more judges than anyone else. That's not necessarily a, a great thing, but it's uh, just a fact I want to report. The main conclusion I've come to at the end of these uh, 12 years, which I want to say to you, is just two things. One is a borrowing from Justice Krishnaya's uh, uh, wonderful phrase. He had one, many wonderful phrases. He described the uh, the judiciary uh, as a system characterized by judicial excellence and a management mess. Now, judicial excellence, in part, yes, he was bringing, I think he was preparing the audience for the second part, which is it's a management mess. It is a management mess. There is no other system in the world where you can uh, take as long as uh, you will in India to resolve a case. There is no other system in the world where you can get a case decided as fast as you can in India. India is the preferred jurisdiction worldwide for an interim stay order in IPR. Uh, not because of any wrong reasons, simply because they're very well, they've got a few judges in the Delhi High Court who are very knowledgeable and they understand these issues and they go there. So you've seen on one hand, you know, the, the, you know, the, the court meets at three o'clock in the morning to, uh, to, to ensure that Jakub Mehman is hanged. Um, and there's no delay to the hangman schedule. Um, and that's the same, uh, the, 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 the same court where there are many people languishing in jail for many years without getting their attention. So it's not that the system doesn't have capacity, it has capacity. Why is it that it is not working in a rational way is the other question. If it does have the capacity to work well, why is it allowed to be in a management mess? And there's a sort of more substantive reason and a not so substantive reason. The substantive reason is that the Indian uh, constitution has created a huge challenge for India and for the legal and judicial system of India by creating a concept of justice that will require a completely fundamental transformation in the role of the, of the judicial system. The judicial system in India, not unlike in many other countries that had a feudal background in history, was an institution that was created to defend the powerful against the powerless. And the Indian Penal Code, for example, injuries against the individual is only 10, 15% of the entire Indian Penal Code. Most of the Indian Penal Code is about uh, protecting the state and protecting private property. So that was the role. The Constitution of India completely inverted this on its head and uh, asked the judicial system overnight from being an extension of the colonial and feudal law and order machinery to oppress the poor to being suddenly an instrument of social change and social transformation. And in the words of the Supreme Court in a 1980 decision, S.P. Gupta versus Union of India, said that the, the, the judiciary is an instrument of social revolution. The only judiciary in the world that has claimed the right to be revolutionaries. Usually they're sending revolutionaries to jail. 
So suddenly there is a very frightening reason if the system works well, there will be social revolution in India. So it cannot be allowed to work well. Second reason why it's not working well, which is, very, which is part of this first reason, more mundane is, until just Chief Justice Kapadia, he just passed away, um, one of the very fine and very respected uh, judges in the Supreme Court, un until he established this National Court Management Systems Committee, there was never an institutional mechanism inside the judiciary to really reflect on how to improve its administration and management. All this was being done by about one and a half IAS officers sitting in the Ministry of Justice who really came there for three, four years, had no understanding about the judiciary. And they took on the responsibility of, uh, of thinking about how to improve the, the judicial system's management and administration. Even the judges are not trained to do this. It's like expecting a wonderful neurosurgeon to fix the public health system. And um, he doesn't necessarily have the expertise to do that. You know, he's not trained to do that. We do not yet have expertise in India that understands how to, uh, to measure and improve the judicial system. So this is the reason why it is in a mess. Now, the uh, main impact of this management mess naturally falls on the poor who are denied access to justice. And I'll just give you a very brief statistic to illustrate that. Uh, I have called this, and it's now been used quite widely in India, docket exclusion, which I prefer as a term to access to justice, because there's a deliberate docket exclusion. In the United States, there are about roughly 100 million new cases filed every year by a population of 330 million, which roughly means that over 300 new, uh, you know, the, the, over, there are over 300 new cases per thousand population in the United States. In, the, in Europe, it's around 200 to 250. In India, the numbers as of 2014 is there are three new cases filed per thousand population in Jharkhand, four in Bihar, seven in Chhattisgarh, eight in Assam, nine in Odisha, 15 in Uttar Pradesh, 16 in Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. So we have a massive problem of, of docket exclusion of the poor, where people are not getting access to courts to defend their rights. Uh, and uh, those who have money uh, the, the, you know, are able to get justice whenever they want, uh, what, however they want it. Um, and Indian lawyers are amongst the, or not amongst perhaps the highest paid lawyers in the world, the, the top Indian lawyers, because they have the, the magic to, to make the system work and, and the others don't. So there is a huge problem uh, with uh, access to justice, and uh, I'm happy to talk more about it uh, later of the poor. Now, wh what, what, uh, uh, what, are the, what can be done about it? One is, I think, to get the system to be managed better, and for that, the, what is being done is to establish a set of performance standards. For example, we now talk of delays, but there is no time standard for any case in the country as of today. And so you can't say any case is delayed. You can say it takes a long time, but there are no performance standards on timeliness, responsiveness, or quality. The National Court Management Systems Committee for the first time has started to lay down some performance standards. They have to be taken forward and, and implemented. So on the management side, there are many initiatives, judicial education and training over the last six, seven years. I've been very much involved in that, has become routine. And that's also addressing a lot of issues. So the judges are slowly starting to analyze and understand uh, these concerns. But there are also three um, very important um, uh, larger structural transformations that are needed if the access to justice problem is to be solved. Because I have no time, but I could give you some cases. For example, a beggar arrested in Delhi, a famous case, if any of you are interested, it's Ram Lakhan versus State of Delhi. A, a beggar is, a, is, a, is arrested simply for begging, uh, and he's you know, wrongly uh, prosecuted very quickly and sent to jail for a year. Now, he, has he had access to justice or not? Did Yaqub Memon have access to justice when one sitting judge of the Supreme Court said that the Supreme Court had not followed its own rules in terms of how to have a review petition, and he was hanged? Did he have access to justice? Does access to justice simply mean getting your day in court? Or is there something deeper than that, more substantive in terms of what is the quality of justice, what is the concept of justice? And surely the answer is there must be a transformation of the very concept of justice as not being merely what happens within the court. Whatever decision takes place in a courtroom is justice. That's not really the right approach to justice. I have in my academic work tried to say that justice is a standard of human conduct. And for Indian courts, 
justice it means constitutional values human conduct in accordance with constitutional values and it's a measure against which the conduct and decisions of courts must be judged it is not a description of what courts do and so we need to try have a jurisprudential transformation to have much more clarity about what we mean by justice that's the first transformation the second is an institutional transformation and there is the reform of the bar becomes very very central again for lack of time i won't get into it but it's very very central transformation we need desperately a, a, a segment of the bar that is not private sector. India's bar is entirely private sector. We need to have a segment of publicly paid public defenders, like in some states in this country, and um, human rights defenders who, at the lowest level, at the as, as you were saying earlier, Amit, at the at, at the at the level of trial courts, can can help defend the rights of the of the weak and the marginalised sections. And you also need, and this is a controversial statement. I'll just make it. I think the big challenge facing the Indian judiciary is we need to tra transform, democratize the, the judicial system. And for that, I think a very important reform is we must restore the jury system in our country and democratize the, the, the system so that the, the alienation and the gap that now exists between the sense of justice of poor people and the very elite idea of justice that is imposed on them can be uh, eliminated. Finally, we must also, the third structural transformation is a personnel transformation where we must have, the Indian judiciary is now dominated, especially at the top, by Hindu upper caste males. And we need to have a much more diverse judiciary at all levels, especially people who come from very poor backgrounds in order to ensure that uh, the judicial system reflects the concerns of people. And uh, finally, I think the last uh, sentence I will say is that you cannot look at access to justice and docket exclusion in isolation. You cannot solve any of these problems, especially access to justice and docket exclusion, without addressing the issue of social exclusion. We cannot have uh, uh, a society that uh, is unjust, but technocratic means are used by that society to solve particular problems in isolation. Because I should mention in, in conclusion that the number of cases filed per thousand population is highest in Kerala compared to, to other, other parts of the country because there has been a democratic transformation in Kerala. So ultimately the challenge of justice is a challenge of social change. And that's the challenge that the elite in India today not prepared to confront. Thank you very much. Sorry I ran over a couple of minutes. Thank you, Mohan. Uh, greetings to everyone. I wanted to begin by first thanking the organizers for inviting us and a special thank you to Avani for all her hard work. My name is Amit Mukherjee. I work in the World Bank. Uh, before that, I was privileged to serve the government uh, in the civil service in India. I served in Gujarat for a while. I served in Bengal. Um, Bengal at that time had a communist government, so I had the privilege of working with very different kinds of government in India. Then I came to the bank and I, most of my work now relates to justice and access to justice issues. Uh, my team and I, we currently work in about 20 countries in Europe and Central Asia, all the way from Russia to EU member countries like the Bulgarias, Romanias and so on. Uh, we do a lot of work in other regions of the world and most of what we do relates to the two goals of the World Bank, which are the reduction of poverty and promotion of inclusive growth. So let me begin by just drawing your attention to the title of this session, which is Access to Justice, Unique Challenges for India. Let me begin with a very provocative statement that we found to be almost universally true in all the work the World Bank does in different countries, whether it relates to justice or other forms of services that uh, a state provides. We find that when you talk about access to services, and justice in a sense is a service at the end of the day, the rich bribe for speed, the poor bribe for access. Every one of our hundreds of surveys that the World Bank has financed in different countries, surveys done by other organizations, and I'm sure Mohan will agree with me, this is the crux of the problem. And when you talk about India, 
There are so many different stories in India. Every state is different. Every region is different. You cannot have a story that tells you everything about India. And as somebody famously said, if you make a statement about India, any statement, the opposite probably also holds true, given the diversity and the complexity of our country. So I submit to you that while India is a unique country, maybe the challenges it faces are not that unique. There are other countries which face the same challenges. There are countries that deal with them in different ways. And maybe one of the things that we need to think about is what is there for India to learn from other countries' experience and not reinvent the wheel where access to justice is concerned. And second, what does India have to share with the world? Because there are lots of good things happening in different parts of India when you talk about access to justice. And we'll hear again from Chaya a little later the kind of work that she is doing and hundreds of groups uh, like that are doing. So let me submit to you, following on from what Mohan said, when you think about justice, it's sometimes useful to think of it in terms of demand and supply. Access to justice, there is a demand side to it, and then there's a supply, the state and other actors that provide the access and the services that justice entails. In the case of India, I think today we are looking at a disequilibrium between demand and supply, which is causing some of the complexities that Mohan mentioned, which is probably going to be continuing for some time to come, because quite apart from the notion of the concept of justice that Mohan mentioned, I think it also goes to the heart of a state's capability and intent. The administration of justice or the delivery of justice is a basic function of any state. India is no exception. However, every state is constrained by the resources it has. That sets a limit in how it delivers justice. And certainly in the case of India, as Mohan said, if you look at the inspiring words of the Constitution and you contrast that with the resources that the state has, there is a certain imbalance there. And I think the challenge in India is at three levels. Number one, how do you promote access to justice for the most vulnerable and the marginalized? That's where the biggest social and development challenge lies. And here we talk about not just the marginalized in terms of income, but also minorities of all kinds, women, under trials, prisoners, juveniles, the homeless. There are so many different categories of vulnerable groups. And perhaps one of the things that is now beginning to happen in India and probably which needs to speed up is how focus on these vulnerable groups and their access to justice can be speeded up. And here again, different countries have done different things to promote this. Think about the role of technology. We had a session a little while ago where different speakers talked about the role of technology in India. We can do a lot more to use technology to promote access, to reap the digital dividend that India has not yet been able to reap. And I think one other aspect of this fascinating potential to harness technology also has to do with the role of the diaspora. India, and you all are a perfect example of this, is fortunate in having an extremely talented, extremely capable, and very ded dedicated diaspora. And this is where the role of the state comes in. What, how does India's state or the government reach out and use the talents that India's diaspora has, not just in this country, but globally. And if you look at countries like China, I think we have things to learn from them on how the diaspora can contribute to issues of social and economic development. I will also submit to you that one other issue that is unique to India is the issue of how the resources are managed. And Mohan referred to that when he talked about the management mess. India is not unique in that. Most countries struggle 
to modernize their judiciaries and instill a management culture in the way justice is handled, delivered, and managed. India, I think, has a lot to learn from different countries. It has a lot to learn, for example, from OECD countries. It has a lot to learn from its neighbors in Asia. If you look at the Singapore's and the Korea's and the Australia's, these judiciaries have done marvelous things in improving the management of their human, financial, technological, and physical resources. I think there's lessons that India can learn from them. Equally, I think there are lessons that India has for the rest of the world in the field of access to justice. And one of the points I'd like to put before you is that there is a global conversation that is intensifying on access to justice issues. And it's not just justice as delivered by the courts, it's a much broader notion of justice. Think about the Arab Spring. Think about other countries where the young, the marginalized, the disenfranchised don't see any opportunity to get an education, to get jobs, to get justice. And what is happening, what we see in the World Bank is that many, many countries across the world are now beginning to look at justice actually as a national security issue in some cases. It's that strategically important. And I guess my question is, how does India look at this? I don't know. But maybe India needs to play a larger role in the global conversations that are now taking place on justice. What we do see is that non-state actors from India, NGOs, civil society, academia, experts, participate in a lot of these conversations, not so much the state. I was in uh, Singapore last week. Um, there was a global conference organized by the Singapore Supreme Court. Uh, we did have representation from India. There were about 10 countries from where chief justices of the Supreme Court had come, a lot more countries where justices had come. One of the issues discussed was access to justice. The Indian representation was, uh, I think, a technical gentleman from the Supreme Court and somebody from the Ministry of Law, and Mohan referred to that. A minor correction, Mohan, uh, IAS officers are indeed in the Ministry of Law, but the gentleman who happened to come was actually from the Railway Personnel Service. Exactly. exactly. So uh, it's great that we have this diversity in our civil service, but does it add to value or performance? And I will close with one thought, which is data is increasingly and hugely important in assessing whether access to justice is indeed improving. And when I heard Mohan say that India is only now beginning to look at definitions of delay, I'm surprised. In very few countries do you find these basic issues being looked at for the first time. And instead of reinventing the wheel, maybe we should look at countries which are doing a better job on this. But one thing I will say, there is a lot of information available on India. If you go to the websites of the different courts, there's tons of information there. But how much of that can be used to draw policy, in, uh, to make policy or change policy? That's a whole different issue. So I'll leave you with just two thoughts. As well-wishers, if that's the right word, of improving access to justice, what can we do to promote access to justice in India where the main actor is no longer only the state, but where non-state actors, whether they be academia, civil society, diaspora, other groups, can play a role in this and work in harmony with the state, so that at the end of the day, we don't have to confront a situation where the rich bribe only for speed and the poor have to bribe for access. Thank you.
Okay, good, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you so much for giving the opportunity to be here and to listen to the perspectives, uh, various perspectives from uh, both Mr. Amit and uh, Mohan, uh, truly coming from that field. Um, for me, as you might have looked at in my uh, uh, bio, that I come from a lot of technology background. I, I, with my company, um, I think more from a technological way of solving things. And then with my NGO experience, I work with a lot of uh, destitute street women and uh, street children, uh, um, bringing them into the NGO and working through their problems and giving them not just the education and the basic amenities, but creating them as independent individuals who can not just survive, but also can fight for their rights. Now this is huge, right? When I speak this, it looks like a huge project. But if you really look at the grassroots, it is easy to um, speak about the, you know, the, all the flaws in the uh, judicial system, and you can talk about access to justice, a lot of these things, but as an individual, is anybody able to understand what their rights are and what they can fight for? I think, for me, the belief is individual development, it leads to you know, educating your own family, your own society and community, and that can evolve into actually a national change or a movement. But everybody, if they do in their own world, little world, understanding their basic rights of how to survive. The de definition of survival, what we say is basic amenities, right? Food, shelter, clothing, at the most medication, education. Where is the entire thought about ha what are my rights? Until I grew up and I started working with these children, I didn't even know what human rights I have as an individual. I was reading an article just a few days ago. Um, the president of India himself said, uh, Prime Minister of India himself said, Mr. Narendra Modi, that he never got even an exposure until he started really working on these legal issues in India. So I would like to focus more on, I would share a couple of stories with you um, because you will understand from what my perspective is about. And then maybe we can talk about some possible solutions. So one of the stories, so my kids, whom we bring from the streets, we give them education, shelter, everything. And naturally, these kids have grown up into teenage uh, children. One of the girls was constantly harassed by the local youth group. Now, that youth group is a political youth group. And the girl was harassed to so much that we were receiving phone calls to the organization asking us to send the girl to their house. And the guy is enjoying some drinks with his friends, whatever. And it's one, it's humiliation. Two, nobody has the right to hurt that girl or say anything to her, right? Three, as an organization, we have our social status there and nobody can even say such things to us. So today they said that tomorrow they might just kidnap her and take her somewhere, right? How do we stop that? So first thing I said to that girl is, you know, what we have to do is go to the local police station, right? So first I spoke to the people that I know. They said, don't go to the police station. Why? They're supposed to protect. No, no, you don't want to get into that. Don't get to the police station. Let's use the political influence. Believe me, when we made a call, to the local leader from a political party that is active, we expressed the issue and the problem was resolved right the next day. Now tell me, I had some influence. Think about people who don't have any influence. How would they deal with that situation? They'll succumb to this situation because most of these children did not have any access to the basic rights they have. So what is the solution to that? Awareness. You don't know what you don't know. That's a fundamental thing. Survival is not just getting what you need for surviving. It, survival is also about understanding your rights and to be able to survive with dignity 
in the society and to be able to save in the society. So as part of this uh, exercise, we also uh, talked about some of the aspects, you know, there's another story where they had no money to get the justice to what was going on. So you have to effort, either you have to have the influence, political influence, or you should have the money to effort to pay these humongous fees to these lawyers. So now we are again talking about the problem. But for me, the fundamental thing is, one, to be able to provide that awareness across. In the school systems today, whether you say in India or even in Harvard, I was talking to a few students who are from Harvard doing the law course here. Do they teach you about the fundamental human rights in school? Starting from school, why don't we think about teaching the children about fundamental human rights? I think there is some awareness here in this country, but I don't think it's there in India. There is a taboo, you are not even supposed to speak about certain things. But giving that fundamental basic rights information in school system and then kind of raising that above when, you go, when you, the kids go into college or universities, learning more, build upon it. And there are so many student organizations, there's so much knowledge sharing that can happen. Right, that is about the awareness. Now how do I use this from a technology point of view? There's so much globalization happening. There's so much technology, online cloud services, online services. You go to any online legal services websites, they're very industrial focused websites. It's all about how do I get my templates to write a contract? Or I have some issue, how do I resolve it? One good thing I had went through a great experience is Lemon Law. I don't know how many of you had the experience where I could really fight the case. But how many people know that lemon law exists? So there is fundamental things that people can be educated in. And as the kids are very smart. They can learn very quickly. We uh, have these video games, right? They all give you entertainment. Is there a video game that tells me if I'm in a situation, I type in how do I deal with situation? It tells me what all things I can do. Simple thing. It doesn't. So there, there has to be, again, there has to be budget, everything to uh, understand and work with the legal system. So a lot of the, our technology companies like us would be happy to do that. But it is one thing for me that uh, the basic things are, one is giving the awareness, two is educating people. And all the other political issues, resolving all these uh, you know, legal uh, reformations and everything, we have these people to take care of it. But I think at the individual level, we have to really step up and make sure whether it is educational system especially needs to come step up and educate people about their basic rights. Now coming to um, play of uh, role of NGOs because I, I, I have that background. Uh, no offense, I feel NGOs are actually able to do better than the government organizations or the even judiciary system because NGOs not only work at the ground roots, grassroots, they also understand the issues at that level. When they understand the issues, they quickly form groups and they quickly come up with projects. Some of the projects that we do are uh, creating microfinance groups for women, treating, teaching them how you manage your money, how you don't get cheated. And how you, like there are so many families where they, they have these men as drunkards, they don't take care of the family, they beat up the women, the women get, gets beaten up and still she feeds the husband with so much love. I still cannot understand that even today. But think of those aspects where the NGOs can get to that level and influence the minds. So what we do today is we do street plays, um, if the children go from our NGOs and they actually play the entire scenario in the street and they, they can actually watch and see and they also play what they, what they should be doing to address that issue. And that had a tremendous impact. And the second thing was we, we had um, actually gone to the, uh, these women, the social workers go and educate them about their rights and also work with the local panchayat leaders to ensure that these women are getting what they're supposed to get to be independent. And the, uh, and the third thing I want to say is, it's, you know, when you look at the medical industry, you see uh, these are on the go, people go and uh, provide medical assistance and there are camps. They actually put camps down there and then they work with people and they give them medical uh, 
attention or whatever treatments they have to give. Why don't we have it in the legal system? Why not these lawyers go camp out and have these sessions with people? So there are many things that can be done, but it is really a collaborative effort that, that needs to come out. But I think the NGOs really play a huge role because they're the ones hands-on, they're working day-to-day -day with these issues, and they and the, and the judicial system can work together. There's a, this collaboration is going to be extremely effective. Thank you. Wonderful, so I think I'll start um by, by asking a question actually to each of, each of the panelists and then we'll open up more broadly and, and looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so these were wonderful presentations and I, I learned a lot and, and, and I, I, I think it really gives a good sense of, of, of where, gives us a handle on many of these access issues. I wanted to start with uh, uh, Mohan Gopal. Um, you know, you had talked and very provocatively um, and I think correctly about what are the changes that need to occur to the bar? Um, to, to broaden access, and you talk about uh, public defenders or having human rights advocates. Um, and as you know, there's this, I, I think it's the right impulse to say we need a bar that is worrying more about these issues. And maybe that's designating certain kinds of lawyers for that, but we also in India right now have a bar that's often blocking access in the sense of it's slowing down how long it takes to uh, get through uh, the courts. You, you have lawyers slowing down cases for their clients. And in some other countries, you know, judges play a much stronger role in kind of managing timelines um, with, within uh, the courtroom. But because of the overall power of the bar, and you know this, but you know that bars frequently go on strike in many uh, states if they don't like what is going on with the judges. Uh, maybe it happened to you. Um, how do you change this dynamic, right? Or do you think this is a dynamic that needs to be changed? And if so, how do you change that dynamic kind of as, as, as part of this broader change? And I'm just gonna ask each question um, sure. and then I'll circle back to you. Sure. Um, and Mr. Murkaji, I wanted to ask you, you know, you talk about, you know, that there's these unique access challenges in India, but then many of the challenges that India faces, and I think you're right about this, are not that unique, right? We, every country likes to think it's unique, um, that it, you know, it has its own history and its own particularities, but at the end of the day, there's, there are these common challenges. And one of the things I've noticed and you've commented upon about India, and maybe the US, for example, isn't that different in this regard either, is it, it isn't integrated kind of into this international conversation um, as you mentioned, um, in terms of thinking about the low-hanging fruit of lessons learned from other countries. And I guess my question to you is, why is that, right? There's one thing to observe that and to kind of say, we need this to change, but to think about the reasons why that occurred in the first place. Is it just India is a big country and so it doesn't think it needs to look elsewhere? You know, in the US, we're often more interested in experiments in the, state than in the states than anything going on abroad. And there's logic to that and there's a reason, you know, we have that impulse in both countries. But, but why do you think those reasons are and, and how might you change? change that. And then, um, Ms. Pamula, um, you know, I, I found this really fascinating and it also rang uh, some truth to me. Um, you know, you talk, and there's a bit of a kind of contradiction, and I think it's a contradiction or um, a tension that civil society groups face, which is on the one hand, you know, civil society groups are trying to teach people about their rights, um, trying to incorporate them into the legal system. Um, and then, but who are those rights going to be enforced against? And if you actually get onto the ground, and I found this looking with grievance redress around kind of social welfare programs, no one turns to the court first. Right? They go to local politicians first. And so there's all this emphasis in civil society groups about rights training in a very kind of legalistic language. And I guess one of my questions for, is that the right approach, right? Um, there's a lot of money being spent in that regard, but if how problems are being solved on the ground is how do you best approach your local politician? How do you get over the biases of your local politician that they might have against your group or your person? Um, and is there a tension in doing these two things? If we strengthen those roots, right? Are we going to weaken the ability of the legal system to deal with this later on? So I'll, I'll just have, give you a, a minute or two for each of you to respond and then we'll open it up. Okay, um, uh, th thanks Nick, very good uh, questions. Um, the, uh, the, the work that is now going on is, in is actually intended to gradually build a, a set of standards on timelines. 
and um, which has only begun now and then to start a process where those uh, uh, timelines and court management systems can be organized around honoring those timelines and i think the bar will cooperate uh, w with those with those initiatives in fact uh, there is one such system that has worked in kerala it's called the list system of management where timelines are established and are followed and as a result in civil cases kerala has actually a very good record of uh, of uh, timely disposal and um, it's been there for many years now and it's it's been quite productive so I think the, once we have a proper um, management system in place with standards, I think there will be cooperation. Then the, um, but if you simply tell them to arbitrarily follow standards, that, that won't happen. It must be reasonable. Um, so that's the one point. This, uh, the larger point, I, I mean, that, that's all I can say within the one minute um, uh, time you've given me. But the larger point I want to make is that the rich are able to uh, you largely uh, get what they want out of the justice system in all countries because they can afford very high uh, quality legal uh, help I mean uh, and uh, forensics and all that um, so also the rich in India the middle class in India did not have an effective judicial system do not have an effective judicial system that's what's different about India that other OECD countries and developed countries, the middle class has also got a well-functioning judicial system. We don't. But no country in the world, including the United States, I'm going to get in trouble with my daughter, she's an assistant district, district attorney in Philadelphia. I wrote this publicly in the Indian Express, I got a mouthful from her. The United States has the worst criminal justice system in the world for poor people. Right? So how to ensure justice for the poorest and the poor people is a problem that no country in the world has solved. If, if there is such a system, please refer it to me and we will be very happy to learn from them. That's the, the cutting edge problem. And, and in, in India we have plenty of poor people, 70-80%, so it's a huge problem for us. But I am uh, 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 optimistic that in the next fairly short period of time, maybe next 5-10 years, the middle class will start to get the system. Now all this data is there because of all the work that's been done in the last six years by s several people, you know, which I've also been a part. So, you know, there is SMSs being used, there is technology being used, a lot of, of, of progress is happening and the middle class will start to see positive change for them. But will the 70% get justice? Probably not. And, uh, you know, um, th that's, that's, the way, that's the challenge that we have all got to apply our, our mind to and I think India will have to think of its own way forward. It's a very, very complex problem. Thanks. Um, let me try to respond to your very thought-provoking question. I think actually the way I see it, uh, what you say happens in India because of two reasons which may actually be contradictory in a way. Number one, the very fact that India is a functioning democracy at every level also means that there is a huge amount of cushion in the system for the system to absorb the frustrations of people and to have it absorbed by the kind of anecdote we just heard. You can go to your politician, you can go to somebody you know to make a call to somebody to get something you need done. So it doesn't really put pressure on the system to deliver because there is this buffer. At the same time, when you talk about justice, it's also very sensitive because courts in India traditionally have been very, very jealous in guarding their independence. But what we lack in India perhaps is that the flip side of independence is always accountability. You look at OECD countries, you look at the US, and if you look at the code of ethics, and Mohan mentioned that and I also want to highlight that, in countries like the US, people in the judiciary are subject to an extraordinarily strict code of ethics. I've had US judges, I've invited them, they travel with me to Russia and other countries. The amount of paperwork they have to submit because they are receiving, uh, they're traveling with us, everything is disclosed. India, not so, yet. We are getting there, but we have a long way to go. Thirdly, the main challenge in India, the way I see it is, as we are saying, the 1% can buy their policies and the decisions and whatever they need. The 99% can't. 
The difference in India is that of the 99%, maybe 30 or 40 are low income, they are poor. And a significantly additional part of it is also vulnerable in some form or the other. You don't have that profile in too many countries. And that profile in India means that this is the voiceless, the unorganized, the informal sector, and they have nobody to speak for them. So unless there is public pressure in some form or the other, either through the political system or through some other means, the pressure on the formal justice system to improve probably is going to take a while to happen. I, th I think your question was more about um you're talking about educating this uh, poor sector about their rights and then the po local political situation that could be influencing, right? So there is a barrier there. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's, a, it's very tough. I don't know if we have the solution for it. But my observation is I, when you go to these rural places, um, when you see these people are being educated about their rights, about how they should fight for their rights, by um, many organizations that come in, NGOs come in, and the social workers go and train them. My observation is most of that is happening in silos. It's not a collaborative effort. It's happening in, in silos. So the change needs to happen from bottom up and top to down, right? So if it is bottom up, it is from the individual being educated about basic rights. And then the individual working with the communities and the communicate, communities working to get, uh, together to form a much larger change organization to be able to influence people to follow what they are learning through these um, uh, trainings that are happening. Now, when at the top level, when they, there are policy making, um, there are judicial systems that are making the policies and then they are going through all this and bringing it down, the problem is there's like a black box. So there are people who are making the policies and working for um, imp improving the judicial system. And then we have this grassroots level. They are doing their own efforts trying to educate people, but there's no connection. The connection can happen if you, like you all know about uh, uh, the uh, uh, social media, Facebooks, right? These days there is so much awareness for people when they cases are put in Facebook and so why not these communities are established in this social media and then also the people who are making the policies should be participating in these communicate communities there's a buy-in from them that way there is less of a ba barrier you will uh, have to face because it has to be a top-down and bottom-up approach that will actually give that collaborative effect so, so why don't we, we have a few minutes here. Should we take two or three, question, three questions? Maybe we can take three questions. Yeah, if we'll s oh, oh, there's microphones in the back, sorry. Yeah, sorry, so can you try those uh, questions to take Lana there? So sorry, <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean sorry. to do that little dance, but I kind of <laughs> No, I'm glad you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so um, I do not have a law background by any means. Um, and I, my question could be completely off. But this, the whole discussion around technology, use of social media, uh, everything, like we, we, there was this debate that was sparked when Nirbhaya happened, um, then with the Rohit Vimula case, or even some of the media trials that it, I'm going to term it as a media trial in the, in the Talwar case, uh, in the Arushi murder case and stuff like that. Um, so I guess, I, I guess my question is, do you, would you dismiss this as all, all this, it's good that we are having this debate and discussion, would you dismiss it as armchair activism or do you think there is potential here, um, there's, there's, there's potential in, in this aspect and on this horizon that we could potentially harness? Um, long story short. Yeah, and we're going to take three questions and then the panelists can respond to all, all three at the same time. So my question is kind of related to the previous question. Mm -hmm. We know we are talking about the lack of access, quality of justice, and there's a kind of vacuum in the traditional Indian system. And there's a new phenomena called media trial being going on. It's non-systemic. So I was just curious like how it's going to affect the evolution of the system that we are now talking about. Okay, my question is a little different from judicial justice. It's 
for it's based on economic justice and it's for Mr. Mukherjee because India has entered a new paradigm with the BRICS countries. And I wanted to ask you because, you know, what in your opinion with the BRICS has set up these institutions, AIIB, NDB, what in your opinion has India done since then it, uh, to progress using this opportunity, this win-win opportunity that China says and what more India should do to advance economic justice? Okay, wonderful. So, if the three of you, whoever wants to address about media trials and what that means for the judiciary and, and this economic question. Do you, do you want to start? Sure. Um, very quickly, on the media trials, I think um, uh, there is a, a potential for good and also a, a, a great danger. And the potential for good is that it is highlighting uh, injustice. So particularly the Rohit Vemula case, the uh, Nirbhaya case, it, it actually highlighted uh, issues like in the, the shootings of many young black uh, teenagers in this country. It highlights injustice which is otherwise hidden. Um, and I've been trying to ask myself why is it that Rohit Vemula's uh, case has got so much attention. I still don't know why because every other day a murder takes place of a Dalit uh, that is um, uh, charged under the Atro uh, Scheduled Caste Atrocities Act. We don't hear about it. Every day about 93 people are murdered, most of who are Dalits and, and OBCs and poor people. We don't hear about it. So, and many suicides take place in, on campuses. What is it that actually made Rohit Vemula's case so important is a question in my mind and I'm not going to answer it. So there is a positive side. The danger is that the, there is a fascist lynch mob mentality that is being created. So hang them without any sense of, of understanding about uh, what justice uh, really involves. And there is a, a, a grave danger in that. So uh, that's, that's where I'm going. And I think has it, the second question is, is it affecting the evolution of the judicial system? My answer is no, it's not. It may, it may have an, an impact on the particular case. But it's certainly not since I'm working along with many others in these areas. I haven't seen any, any influence of that in terms of evolving the legal system. It creates public opinion. That public opinion has an impact on legislation. <coughs> For example, draconian changes to the Criminal Justice Act, the rape law, uh, you know, and which, are, you know, which have had no impact on crime. But the politicians have reacted to that. But on the judicial and legal side, there's not been much impact. So these are areas which we have to proceed, I think, very, very cautiously. If I may also respond very brief briefly, because I don't know if, you know, I participated in a BRICS meeting in Brazil on, on behalf of India with the Brazilian Supreme Court. So we had all the BRICS uh, Supreme Courts represented. We uh, shared opinions. So there is actually a lot of state judicial. I took an, a delegation of judges to Australia. And the Australians came to, to India. And we had a series of seminars where the judges were presenting papers. There's a, in fact, just before I came, two days ago, the Supreme Court was, people were discussing how to set up a a, a group that will coordinate the relationship between Supreme Court and other Supreme Courts. There's a lot of bilateral uh, dialogue going on on, on, uh, on, the, on the judicial side. I've also taken them to Singapore uh, earlier uh, frequently. So I think there is engagement. BRICS is somehow kind of not in fashion anymore. There's not much energy behind BRICS. It's been a little bit overtaken, but I think there is a lot of dialogue going on between these various countries. But as I said, and I will say again, that the problem is that the challenge faced by the poor uh, on how to get justice is a, is a challenge that uh, no country has been able to solve in, in the modern judicial system. And, I don't, and we'll all have to work together on it, including BRICS and, and other countries. Um, but uh, you know, let's be hopeful that we'll be able to make progress. Thanks. Um, three questions and very brief responses from my side. Um, on the example of uh, the activism and the Nirbhaya case, my view actually, I agree very much with Mohan. I think that spotlighting in the media the kinds of events that happened in the way they were spotlighted actually impedes longer term judicial and justice development because on the one side, it's very sensationalist. Secondly, it raises expectations which nobody can fulfill. 
and then that leads to public cynicism and again repeats. And in a way, it also provides an opportunity for knee-jerk reactions like, okay, this has happened, we need to change the laws. But the problem is not the laws. The problem is the implementation on every aspect. So I would say that, you know, it's good as a sign of social awareness and keeping the pressure on. But in terms of actual outcomes, I would be probably less optimistic. Secondly, uh, the question about BRICS and economic justice um, and economic opportunities. Uh, in part of the work I do, I've been working on Russia for the last 10 years uh, on all uh, different issues, including judicial issues. I know that despite the different economic circumstances that the BRICS countries now find themselves in, I think there's nevertheless a political momentum that's built up. And as far as I know, this is not the World Bank's view from what little I know, I do believe the new development bank, which is the BRICS bank, aims to begin actually functioning from 2017. Uh, hectic consultations are going on between ministries of finance to put the shape and the structure and the financing together. In the case of both the AIIB and the new development bank, there have actually been frequent meetings with institutions like the World Bank and we are actually collaborating very closely with them in terms of co-financing of projects and sharing of staff skills. So that's going to happen and I think it's good and, it, and the world needs more initiatives like this. Development is a global challenge and inclusive development is an even bigger challenge and I think the more players there are who make a difference, the better it is for the world. So I'll take uh, uh, that one question about the uh, social media and uh, the impact. Um, so I think if by using the social media and having people express their views and perspectives is not only creating the awareness, it is also creating a collaborative awareness, right? So what it means is, somebody who is do, uh, doing a crime and the people don't know about it, and you can again go and do the crime. But with social media and the awareness, you're also, actually you're introducing an element of fear in the minds of the people who are going to do the crime. So in one way, it's awareness, and the other way, it is actually having some impact in reducing the crime by giving that awareness. And unfortunately, today, media focuses more on the problems. They talk about all the things that happened and highlighting all the aspects of the crime, but not really talking about how this was addressed or solved. So I think there is a twist, there is a change that needs to happen in the way the media acts on these things. And also the social media is actually taking power, and, you know, it's actually empowering the communication channel much better than the media. It's because it's truly coming from the grassroots. The feedback is coming from the grassroots. And then, well, if you, you just want to can I just take 30 seconds? Because you yeah. are asking about economic justice. So, and I just want to say that the Constitution envisages that courts will also play a very important role in, in advancing economic justice. And especially in the 14 years between 1973 and 87, when we had some very progressive judges on the Supreme Court, the courts played a very important role in advancing economic justice. But there's been a retreat from that. And there's been a, a, a deferential attitude towards government policy. And so the court's role in ensuring economic justice has now receded. They should play a, a role. Uh, I think, I, you know, the, when we, the issue on the role of the courts came home to me when I asked a, a, a very poor landless Dalit uh, why, why he was not going to a court to enforce his rights, to talk about the demand side and, as you said, awareness. And he gave me a wonderful answer. Normally, judges and lawyers define a court as a temple of justice where rights are protected and the rule of law is upheld. This illiterate Dalit told me, sir, a court is a place where the police takes you to be punished. Nobody goes to a court. So, as, if the role of the court is so alienated from people, it will not be able to be an instrument of economic justice as it was once and it should be. But that's, that alienation is what has to end.
Well, this has been an incredibly rich conversation, and I hope that it's a conversation that continues amongst yourselves over lunch, and you should feel free to come up after and talk to the speakers, who I know will be around for at least a, a few minutes. And I just want to thank the speakers and, and, and thank Avni and the students again for, for putting this together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we put a huge round of applause for all our speakers? Thank you.